Welcome to another week of hot takes. Happy holidays. Yes, I'm in a nice little cardigan. I got new clothes for Christmas. Thank you very much. Let's begin this week with the first hot take. Remove souvenirs. What are the point of souvenirs? It just fills up wasted space in the shop and the battle pass. Agreed. I was going to say, like, I disagree with this take, but this is not a hot take at all. You either remove souvenirs or convert them into, like, a... Uh, uh, a thingy that you can pop over your head pre-game like pre-round or something because like i understand with souvenirs right now it's just another emote slot so a lot of people don't want to emote randomly and then waste their time showing off a fucking pineapple pizza you know what i mean but like in league you can just like flash the emblem over your character as you move around right but i can understand in the middle of a game like flashing like a random souvenir icon over your head can be distracting in like the game elements because it can just like you can do this and then flash a thingy and then it'll like block your Widowmaker sight line from the enemy. You know what I mean? So that'd be a little bad, but like I think souvenirs should be like you can have the pineapple pizza, but just float it over your head, maybe in the pre game, like pre rounds. So when you're walking around, you can do it. And then when the game starts, or when the round starts, then you can't activate them anymore. So they're like a little bit unique. It makes them unique from like emotes and it doesn't intrude gameplay and uh, it won't act as a battle pass filler and just wasted cosmetics. So yeah, souvenirs need a rework. Agreed, not a hot take. Next, hot take. Mauga is overpowered, but his most overpowered feature he has is the sound of his guns. They are so low in, low in bass and loud. It makes a lot of the sounds from the other characters it masks a lot of the sounds of the other characters, reducing the enemy team's overall awareness. <laughs> okay, facts. Not a hot take as well. Agreed. Current state of Malga as of December 26th. Uh, he's very overpowered. Balance-wise and his gun-wise. Uh, I actually think it's a nerf. It's 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 a it's overpowered for other people because they can't hear anything except Malga's guns, but that also nerfs the Malga player because they can't hear anything else. All they hear is the whole time. In their ear but like does a malga really need to hear anything else probably not because like all they have to do is just shoot the other malga they turn off their brain me malga me shoot other malga pop cardiac arrest and survive they don't need to do anything except look at the other one the gun just goes Brr, need more bullets but uh yeah these are just facts these are not really hot takes but hey maybe we'll get into some spicy ones as we carry on so agreed or disagree not a hot take okay Ooh, something something metal ranks let's see if you're stuck in metal ranks on any role, just learn Zarya. You get intense tracking training, you learn better positioning, you can stop learn to stop tunnel visioning, and you learn how to manage resources better. Best character in the game for becoming a well-rounded player. Mm, there's some truth to this. It's not like that hot of a take, but it's on the warmer side of a take compared to the other ones, where the other ones are just facts. This one's like a fair assessment, You for sure. Learning Zarya is, is, is a pretty good hero to, to build a lot of skills in this game. You, like, if I had to list out all the Overwatch skills you can have, there'd be more than, like, 20, to be completely honest with you. Movement, everybody just says movement, positioning, mechanics, but, like, they can be way more broader. Alt tracking, e uh, ultimate economy, um, you know, relative positioning, resource management, timing, uh, there's, uh, if I had to sit there and think, we could probably make a, a more specific list. But uh, Zarya does tick a lot of boxes, so like you said, you do get good tracking aiming, which will help you for tracking-based heroes outside of Zarya. We can name some tracking heroes, like Soldier, I don't know, Sombra, Kiriko with the heals. You do have to track your teammates, right? Any sort of beam character, any other beam character, that's good. Learn better positioning, that's really broad. I mean, every tank has different levels of positioning. You position Zarya a little bit different. When, as compared to like a Reinhardt or as compared to Ball. So like it's unique positioning. So learn better positioning is a bit of an umbrella term, but like every tank needs their own unique positioning. Anyways, uh, learn to stop tunnel visioning. I disagree. I actually think people playing Zarya tunnel vision too much on that take. Agreed? Well, you obviously don't agree with me, the person who wrote this, but people watching this. I mean, even me, I played like a couple hundred hours of Zarya and I still find myself sort of tunneling. As in, like, I just tunnel and just bubble myself a lot of the times, thinking I'm too strong, and then I have so much energy that, like, all of a sudden my brain narrows in and some bloodlust comes over me, like um, Hisoka from um, from Hunter Hunter without the pervy part. But I'm just like, oh, my energy, my laser goes, and then I just dial in 
with the one person only and just beam. But maybe that's just me. But like, uh, you know, tunnel visioning is not good on anybody. So learning to stop doing that on any hero is, is good. But I feel like Zarya is a culprit where you end up inevitably doing it. But if you're self-aware of it, maybe you can trick yourself out of it. So that's one. And you learn how to re manage resources. That's good. Managing your bubble resources is good. You don't have to manage two bubbles, but like picking the right ones is a good skill. So with this take, it's pretty well-rounded, a little warm, but it's all good. Next hot take. Oh, whoa, whoa. I just glanced at this. You're not supposed to combo any ultimates in this game. Any alt can be used alone to get value. Can you combo alts? Sure. If it helps to win the fight, do you have to? Are you supposed to? The simple answer is no. If you nano a soldier alt without alt, he gets no value. It's either because the nano was terribly timed or the soldier is terrible. Okay. Finally, the first hot take to unpack in this one. Uh, um, okay. Overwatch should not be played in absolutes. There's never a yes for everything and a no for everything. So, uh... Let's, let's unpack it. So the first part, your first statement is you're not supposed to combo any ults in this game. That's number one false. Ultimates can be used alone in a vacuum, but a lot of them get synergistic or complementary effects when comboed. So why wouldn't you? So the second part where you said any ult can be used alone to get value, maybe a little bit of general value, but some ultimates get like exponential value when comboed with another thing right so can you combo alt you did sure if it helps win the fight yeah you're supposed to use ultimates to win the fight so you have to determine the value based on the circumstances there so you say something like if you nano a soldier without alt and he gets no value that's that's wrong because like you can totally nano a soldier even without his ultimate to save him if he's in a bad spot and he gets pulse bomb you can nano a soldier and he lives if you guys don't know that because the 50 percent damage reduction the insta heal um, that's already value because you're denying their enemy pulse bomb value without losing a take. So you've already gained value. And even with that, even so, like Soldier sits there with damage reduction and he has like each bullet doing a little bit more bonus damage. How is that ever a bad thing? You can still generate value, but obviously you get synergistic effects if he pops his visor with it. So this one's too like narrow minded with the whole ultimate thing. Um, like you started off with a bold statement saying you're not supposed to, but that's just incorrect. You know what I mean? Just do what creates the most value and comboing will generally make generate the highest amount of value because you complement synergistic effects anyways i'm just rambling next hot take it's very stupid that torbjorn the turret hero has nothing to do with his turret anymore huh what do you mean his turret's still pretty good it got nerfed a little bit but what do you mean it has nothing to do with his turret huh am i missing something here like you throw it and let it go. I mean, you can still repair it. Do, they, do you mean like the leveling thing? You don't upgrade it. You haven't done that in five years. You still throw the turret down, use it as a body block, um, put it in a good spot. You can still repair it with the hammer. I mean, that's his whole fantasy. Like you mean like that's his whole fantasy. No level three turret. But like, I mean, this is a pretty hot take because like Overwatch's in-game balance in a competitive PVP is a separate story from the hero fantasy and the lore. And what you're capable of in, in, in missions and stuff too. Like, sure, it's not as strong in the PvP because you have to balance the game in the competitive PvP setting. But in PvE, do you guys play Torbjorn's level three mission? Bro, that turret mission was actually so fun. He had everything to do with turret. That was his whole factory. Where like you would just like set up different the ice turrets, the knockback turrets. I thought that concept was cool. That shit was awesome. That was the best mission, by the way, out of all of them. And then the lore is still good. They had to get rid of scrap and stuff for competitive reasons, but it doesn't mean he has nothing to do with it anymore as a hero himself outside of the game uh, outside of the pvp game right anyways next oh another torborn hot take torbjorn's kit has a turret shoehorned into it ever since they made it less important to his overall kit i think they should actually lean into the connection between the turret and torb's primary fire i haven't a specific idea but i think it would fit in nicely but maybe extend the aggro priority uh, duration of the turret on targets hit by his primary a three second effect that lasts even after they lose so if they re-enter they get retargeted that's a rough concept but that's the general ideation i disagree with the whole shoehorn thing because like it is less important but i actually think you're cooking with this one a little bit it's actually not that bad of a take once you like get through the rest of it so if, for those who don't know poor bjorn's turret will target the person that you get a hit marker on on the body 
So if there's a Rhine, the turret's focusing Soldier 76, and there's a Rhine beside him on the shield, and I shoot the Rhine shield, the turret will still shoot the soldier because that's who we, it aggroed first. But as soon as Rhine puts down a shield and I land a shot onto the Rhine, the turret switches aggro onto the Rhine until Rhine breaks line of sight, then it'll shoot the closest person. And then when Rhine re enters the line of sight, the turret still shoots the closer person or whatever. So this is just like a, 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 cha a suggestion on changing the uh, the game logic on who the turret shoots. And they're saying the turret should have a better connection with your primary. So if I do shoot the Rhine and he leaves and he comes back, it should reprioritize that. But like, I think that's cool and you're cooking in concept, but it would suck if like they did that and then this low HP tracer blinks right in front of the turret and like it doesn't pick up the tracers because it's still stuck on the Rhine. So like, I feel like it can get a little complicated, but you can maybe find a middle ground between it. So I can kind of see where you're coming from. I don't know about a three second effect, maybe like a kind of like a mercy beam, like a one and a half second lingering effect. If they quickly break line of sight, they have to hide for a little bit longer. But then on the same vein, that's just going to make playing against Torbjorn even more frustrating. A lot of people hate playing against Torb because the turret just constantly pokes at them the whole time. You have to shoot the damn sixth player in the game. And that just makes it frustrating for other players, except for the Torb player, so. Because nobody shoots the damn turret, apparently. You're sort of cooking with that one. Medium take. Next, ooh, onto something like this. We can talk about this again. Next hot take is we should implement a map voting system like in Halo 3. It presents you uh, two options and a neither option that randomly picks a third different map. The maps could even be of the same type, payload, escort, whatever, so the one game mode doesn't become the predominant pick. There are so many maps now that I practically never see some maps. This would also uh, be good to implement if they were serious about adding hero bands later. Um, helps to know what maps you're getting before you pick bands. I played a lot of Halo 3 growing up. I actually don't mind this. Uh, we're at a point where we do have like, how many maps in the game now? 30? That's quite a bit. And then some days you don't see certain ones. And like, once you have like a lot of options, I don't think like having choice is a bad thing. So like, I'm okay with this take. Not really a hot take. It could be added. I don't think the game would fundamentally change with either either like the vote or not vote because you don't have a choice right now and if you have some sort of choice you can avoid some maps that people generally dislike i can see maps like junker town never getting voted in which would be nice for the players but would suck from the developers being like man we put all this we'll never have enough data to like iterate and, and, and fix certain maps if people never play them anymore I mean, fundamentally, what you should do, like, it's hard to make every map hit. I don't know if there's a single game where everybody loves every single map. That's just literally impossible. I think the last, like, five Valorant maps have been, like, hated by, like, a lot of the community. Like, what, Lotus, Icebox, and fucking, like, whatever the three point, I don't even know what they're called. Pearl. Yeah, certain maps would never see the light of day. And I do think what Blizzard should be doing is continue doing what they're doing where they iterate off of current maps and fix them. So Watchpoint Gibraltar, third point, has been fixed recently. Remember they added some new boxes and stuff on uh, electrical box on Hollywood. They revamped uh, Route 66. So the second point has those double like doors that are open on the second phase now. That's pretty nice. As long as they keep doing that, I don't need the map system. But if there are some maps that are just so flawed and so bad to play on, then the, 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 the voting system makes more sense to me. At this time, the only annoying egregious maps for me are probably Havana third circuit Royale needs a rework immediately I like the way circuit is made but like aesthetically but it is so horribly imbalanced I think actually circuit should be a higher priority than anything Junker Junkertown is just not fun for me but if I have to pass the question on to the tr chat right here or the people in the comments name a map that you and a like a section of the map that needs immediate attention now I said Havana 3rd, but I actually think Circuit 2nd and Circuit 3rd should be done before Havana 3rd. Havana 3rd feels capable. Circuit is by far so bad. So bad. Okay. I pass that question on to you. Fill up the chat box here. You guys in the comments. Next hot take. Moira's necrotic orb should be combined with the current orb. Take the smaller hitbox speed and necrotic effect added to the current orb. So what you're left with is a small fast orb. It's still a skill shot. You need to pass through the enemy for the necrotic orb effect to work. If you miss, it still has AOE damage and it bounces off walls and stuff. So I would have after the first 15 meters after it bounces, the orb slows down, necrotic, blah, 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 blah. you can keep skill orbs, give more SMU to the... No. I actually think there's nothing wrong with having simple heroes with simple kits. Complicated, convoluted kits are actually too much in this game, in my opinion. 
It's one of the reasons why they removed Life Weaver's ability too. If you guys are like new, new Overwatch players, like last four months, you might not even know that Life Weaver had another ability and they just got rid of it. It was his passive, where um, he uh, he dropped the parting gift that would heal any person that picks up his health kit, <laughs> both enemies or friendlies. His flowers, yeah. And like Life Weaver has a button bound on everything, and his control scheme was whack, and they had to do like a lot of a lot of tinkering to have the system that they currently have a classic control and a modern control or whatever so if we have moira with a damage orb healing orb necrotic orb necrotic orb is a damage reduction orb they introduced in the beta last year and they ended up getting rid of it so for those who don't even know what that means it was like a damage reduction skill shot orb that if you land it it would just do it but like i think moira is nice in its simplicity i actually think moira has played more than ilari right now in the higher levels by far um and i think it's okay to have simple heroes i think every i think a lot of game developers have this thing where they feel like they need to one up every new hero with more complicated things and then your reworks if you're reworking old heroes by trying to add stuff to make it more complicated it just doesn't like a lot of times it just doesn't hit just keep certain things simple you know what i mean i think it's i think more is fine the way she is she has her niche still played sometimes in the overwatch league you play it with rush lucio moira I think it's okay. Next hot take. Farah is a hard counter to everything on all console platforms. I'm gonna be honest, I don't play console. I haven't played console Overwatch ever really. Um I used to play console Halo 3 and COD when I grew up. So like I know the uh the difficulty of aiming on controller, but some people are really good, even without aim assist with their thumb aiming now. So they're saying Farah is probably a hard counter because I assume Hit scan counters are less reliable because it's harder to have precision based aiming. But I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of a nasty snipe nasty sniper on Halo 3 when I was a teenager. I'm just saying. Farah Mercy or Farah is not a hard counter to everything, but can certainly be a little bit more obnoxious on console, and I can understand that. So I wouldn't really say it's the hottest take, because it's not a hard counter, but like there's some substance there, and I could probably see where the frustration is is, is coming from interesting take here this one has a lot of upvotes the whole reason they made armor is to make it quicker to heal otherwise just give them a 30 percent bigger health pool armor was created to heal faster not to reduce damage i'm a little lost here there's a lot of upvotes on this comment i think if you're watching this youtube video we've already re-edited it and made it a little bigger because this is just a screenshot below me as i'm doing this live but the reason why they made armor originally before they simplified it in Overwatch 1 was that armor had a unique property where smaller instances of damage were weaker on armor. And you needed to use bigger bursts. So it would be like up to five damage would be, everything would be cut in half up to five damage per instance of damage. So like, you know, tracer pellets are like, what, like six damage a pellet or something? That would be cut to three. But then big, it would, it would just reduce it by a flat amount of five or by half, basically, once you reach the low run. So it would be a 50% reduction against like Tracer would do half damage on armor. But then uh, heroes like, I don't know, like Farah would, do, instead of doing 120, it would just do 115. So the relative reduction is really little because it's a flat five reduction, which gets cut in half once you're in the low numbers. So it was a different property back then completely. And now it's changed. So like... Um, you say they may otherwise give them a 30% bigger health pool that simplifies it even more, but there's actually a merit or like a, 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 a competitive ch balance change to actually prioritize healing a tank or a hero while their armor is still up. If that makes any sense. Like if you give them a 30% bigger health pool, it's still different than having that armor 30% reduction, even with this new simple version. Like if my Mauga is like losing its uh, initial 250 armor as his armor is almost up he's going into regular health as long as he's like healing enough to maintain a little of that armor or i pump enough heals before he reaches that like the amount of damage the enemies do is just lower during that entire section and that actually changes it quite a bit and the 30 percent armor actually does compound a lot with uh, other damage reduction abilities like the cardiac arrest or like when ramatra has armor and he's blocking he's blocking more than what a doomfist can so like there's a lot of properties that armor creates and I don't think the concept of armor is a bad thing. I just think some tanks have too much of it at this point, AKA Mauga. Um, but yes, healing armor is more valuable than health. You put it into better words. Um, so like your take on saying armor was created to heal faster 
is and not reduce damage just sounds wrong to me. It doesn't seem like that's the original intent. Next hot take. The most fun and skillful heroes are the ones getting constantly ignored by the devs. Genji, Ball, Lucio. It's a bit of a hot take because for me is, is that fun and skillful is subjective, right? Fun is very subjective. Skillful, I think you mean something like a, a skill ceiling where like, if you are more skilled, you might be able, you get more out of Ball or Lucio or Genji. You can have better wall ride mechanics. You have better Ball rolling and double boop text, Genji, good aerial movement manipulation. But like skill is sort of capped on more simple heroes like maybe Moira, where the biggest skill representation is mostly like the fade jumping and just natural movement. But like once you suck or just throw out an orb, there's not much dimension to it past a certain point. But there's more dimensions to elevate on the other heroes. So, um, I just want to break, I just wanted to dissect that part first. Now the next part where you said they're constantly being ignored, I wouldn't say constantly being ignored. Um, it's just the other things are generating a bit more value. So it feels like they're left behind, but Genji received a couple of changes in overwatch too. ammo count back to 30. I think it was at 24 at one point. Um, Genji had the DPS passive. He was really meta in season one ball had like a, a one or two week phase. But they're iterating on ball changes now. They've already said they might change him soon in the next season or two. But he had a phase where he was pretty good, but like he's kind of fallen behind simply due to like all the other changes that other things have happened. So it's less about their getting knocking changes. It's like other things, other things in the game have been added to make the heroes like them a bit more harder to play. So like Brig getting the stun on the uh, the rally alt. Uh, Sombra getting reworked for the easy hacks. Life Weaver being able to like grip people out of like ball slam and platforms and all that stuff. Lucio is actually one of those heroes that you don't really need to touch at this point. I think he's good when he's good, when he's really good. And then like he has a very high skill ceiling that like I feel like nobody complains too much about Lucio. He's like in a pretty good spot, I would say. Good, good in brawl, decent solo queue hero, has multiple play styles. Uh, maybe boop is bugged a little bit when you boop uphill, I think, but like, I think that's the only, uh, criticism he has. But I wouldn't say Lucio is ignored. I would say, like, you don't have to, when you say ignored, it, it's implying that it's bad or imbalanced and you need to fix it. But like, it's, it's, I don't think Lucio is bad right now at all. He's just a team dependent and I think that's okay. He's a good hero. Good hero when he's good. You know what I mean? Hot take. Tanks should be strong like Orisa and Mauga and they should feel like raid bosses. In 5v5, tanks explode all the time with how much damage there is to the game. Players should need to work around the enemy tank, not through them. I think tank players just want to feel very powerful right now. They want to be like, haha. So like right now in this Malga meta, all the Malga players are loving it. Everybody else is not. Like the thing is when you make one thing fun for one, it's probably not fun for the other party. I like support, supports are strong, people bitch about supports and their utility in Overwatch too. Now that Malga is strong, everybody like, I'm allowed to bitch about Malga being so hard, like he's doing more damage than anybody else in the game. And if DPS is just strong, like in season one, the game is run by Sojourn and everybody falls asleep, blah, blah, blah. Ah, it's a Sojourn meta, Sojourn so OP. You literally can't please anybody. My take is to stop bitching, play the game and get good. But no, I disagree with them having to feel like raid bosses. I think some, I think, the best part about Overwatch is the variety of choices you have, right? You can play Orisa and Mauga who do feel like great bosses, or you can play more finesse like Ball. Like Ball's playable as long as they don't have like a gazillion things to counter it. And you can kind of tech it in until that you make them swap. Um, you can play like a Rhine and be more of a, you know, a shieldy hero. You can play very aggressive. You can play slower style like Sigma. Like I think the, 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 the variety of choices is kind of what makes the game fun, especially for a casual base. It's very, casual friendly in that capacity now and the high level competitive balance in any game people are just going to inevitably pick what's like the strongest and like i don't think there's ever been a meta where people are happy to be completely honest with you and i think people will say collectively dive may be the happiest but that's because the people who you see praising dive are actually mostly dps players because they're the loudest people on twitter and social media I'm going to be honest, as a support player, I actually like, uh, I like Brawl, to be honest with you. I actually like Poke as well, more so than those two. Cause my, if, if Dive is meta, I get fucking, I'm dead. I'm, I'm, I'm public enemy number one on the enemy, uh, from the enemy. Cause I'm a, I'm a lowly, oh, I'm a little lowly support in the back. And then they just solo jump me. 
I need to if like if, I, if it's a dive meta and my other support isn't like Brig and I'm playing Ana, I'm probably dead. They just send three people after me. I'm cooked. All right, final hot take of the week with the new ranked 3.0 cross platform in ranked is needed. Even if it's just uh, its own separate game mode like that five stack only they tried. It is truly awful to play a team game in capitalization where you're forced to split up based solely on platform 2023, even if you are of the same skill. This new change in 3.0 talking about how the team aspect is so important and making queues more open between ranks is just another kick to the gut to cross platform friend groups if this change is not made. So that is a hot take. Cross platform ranked is not needed, to be honest with you, especially in ranked play. Now you say uh, it's a kick in the gut for cross platform friend groups. If you're a cross platform friend groups, Play quick play together. Play custom games. I think there've been more. There's been more. I follow Apex loosely because they have cross-platform ranked on Twitter, and it is actually like there's there's more bitching than I've ever seen ever. Like people bitch about supports and Mauga on Overwatch, and I don't even follow a lot of Apex creators, and I get more bitching about console aim assist versus PC players. This this discourse is like too much for me. I had to mute it. So I do not think. Like Overwatch needs cross-platform ranked at all. Play quick play with your friends on cross-platform and leave it at that. I prefer the game. Keep it. Keep like people who are playing ranked on the same platform. If anything, the only cross-platform thing that could work is maybe console can be pooled with all the other console players, where you're supposedly on the same playing field. If you're on a controller, like Switch could play against PlayStation, could play against Xbox, but like leave it in that pool if that's possible. Maybe there's some other issues I'm unaware of that could that could spark from that. But until then, keep it limited. It's a hot take. I think that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Happy holidays. Leave more in the comments. Bye.